Wire of Gothos is a story about power. Power is the goal of our lives. It may disguise itself as money or fame or success or even love, but it all comes down to power. After all, what is money but the power to buy what you want? What is success but the power to choose your own path and destiny? And what is love but the power that makes you protect the ones you care for? Power, wielded correctly with logic and discipline, can be a force of tremendous good. But power wielded without discipline, without logic, can also be a force of destruction. They make a perfectly exquisite display pair. But I suppose you want them back now. When Gene called me, uh, it, I didn't know who Gene was. Uh, I, I knew there was a, a show called Star Trek. I, did, I remember saying to my agent one, get me on that Star Trek th thing that they got. Ah, so you were the captain of these brave lads. My greetings and felicitations, Captain. So good of you and your officers to uh, <laughs> drop in. Absolutely smashing. And when I got the call, uh, he, uh, he said to me, I've got a great part for you. Bill, I know your work. And I said, well, what is, it, uh, what is the part? He said, well, there are a lot of people who don't believe you can do that character this character. He said it's a part of a kind of an English flop. Oh, how marvelous! His name was Trelane, Squire Trelane, retired, and he was a fantastic character. It, it, it was very easy for any actor who had, had any training to play the Squire of Gothis. I never stated I was the only one that could do it. Women? Do you mean that you actually have members of the fairer sex among your crew? Oh, how charming. I thought of any number of actors that I would emulate to, uh, that would be back of my mind that played these types of characters. The character was so well written, and of course it was the show. Oh, this is better than I'd planned. When you're doing something like that, you have to remember that you're wearing the clothes of the period, so you have to have a kind of a... I took a thing once I remember at the theater wing called Styles of Acting, where you'd wear these kinds of costumes, and that's when my training came in handy. And it was a, just a great role. I mean, it was hard to lose on that role. I object to you. Oh, Mr. Spock, you do have one saving grace after all. You're ill-mannered. <laughs> the human half of you, no doubt. <laughs> now, if you were really bad, it could cause you irreparable harm, but uh, it was just a great part. I mean, it was sensational. I'll never forget it. There's an interesting continuity mistake in this episode. Trelane states that he's been studying the Earth of nine centuries ago, but he describes events that took place in the early 18th century. That would place Star Trek in the 27th century, not in the 23rd, where it belongs. One of the reasons for this was that at this early point in the series, the Star Trek universe was not clearly defined. References were constantly changing. In one episode, the Enterprise was part of Starfleet. In another, it was part of the United Space Probe Agency. Later in the series, things would settle into the pattern that we've come to know. And now, Captain James Kirk, you stand accused of the high crime of treason against the superior authority. Conspiracy and the attempt to foment insurrection. Gene Kuhn did something that I thought was marvelous. When I got the part of the squire, I was taken over to get the wig for the court scene. My picture, and it was described in the script, was of an English barrister who wore a wig that was like a little napkin 
curled up. The prisoner may approach the bench. They started that scene late in the day of me as the judge. And they call for the wig. And the makeup person comes over, opens up the box, and takes out a wig and puts it on, and I look like an old Shirley Temple. Uncalled for. It was a French period wig, you know, uh, very curly and full, and I immediately told him, you got the wrong wig. You are guilty. On all counts, you are guilty. And I remember Bill, it was a late in the day, he'd been working this off, and he came over and he said, Bill, what difference does it make there? Nobody's going to know that. I said, it does have a difference to me. I said, it's not only difference in the acting that I would do, but it isn't right. Ah. We debated a little bit, and they called Gene Kuhn's office. Gene Kuhn came over. Silence! He says, Campbell's right. Get the right wig. Shoot something else. We'll pick it up later. I've had enough of your games. Oh, the absurdity of these inferior beings. He wanted to keep it right. Both he and Roddenberry had that great thing about the thing had to be feasible, had to be right. And I like that. Enterprise. <laughs> Captain Kirk. You must try harder, Captain. This is too easy. The voice of Trelane's father sounds familiar. It's because it was provided by the man behind Mr. Scott, Jimmy Dewan. Trelane's mother's voice was provided by Barbara Babcock. Both Jimmy and Barbara would provide many other character voices over the course of Star Trek's three seasons. And Barbara would be seen on screen in A Taste of Armageddon and in the third season episode, Plato's Stepchildren.